The Philippines welcomes the next six years with optimism, grounded on a favorable investment policy environment. Uh, in the next years, yeah, we're uh, currently expanding uh, our capacity uh, in producing rebars. She says the health crisis has made things difficult, but the prices of basic goods are an added burden. The Philippines is one of the most dynamic economies in Asia since it is a recently industrialized developing market. The nation is striving to industrialize and prosper economically, although it is still in the developing stage of its economy. According to the International Monetary Fund, the Philippine economy ranks 36 in nominal GDP globally and 15th in Asia. In 2023, the Philippines are making the shift from an agricultural economy to one that is increasingly reliant on the service and industrial sectors. It has seen radical economic and social change in recent years. Starting in 2010, the country's economy has grown by an average of around 6% each year, making it one of the fastest growing in the area. To compete with its neighbors, the Philippines has turned into an exporter of manufactured products, which is no small feat for one to the world economy. In the late 18th century, the Philippine steel business. However, there are two main reasons why the nation is not yet deemed to have an industrializing economy. First, there hasn't been any prolonged era of high development in the nation. Instead, its attempts at modernization are typified by periodic periods of prosperity, followed by economic collapse. Second, deindustrialization is happening right now. Because of these circumstances, the Philippines stands out as an exception in a region characterized by thriving economies. Why has the country failed to industrialize and achieve a sustained path of economic progress? How did neighboring countries like Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and now Vietnam managed to industrialize while we are still struggling. There are a lot of Thai and Indonesian-made cars driving in the Philippines. The steel sector is experiencing the same problems. Dot one of the professors who made a joke about the Philippine steel industry said, it consists of beauty salons that curl GI roofing sheets. Perhaps this can be attributed to the Filipino first import substitution policy that has been in place in the Philippines since the 1950s. High tariffs and other hurdles to entry were put in place to preserve our so-called infant sectors. Customers were forced to pay more for inferior goods. Its infant businesses stubbornly persisted despite the passage of many decades. With their backs protected, they had little motivation to upgrade their methods. As a result, it never became an industrialized nation. Its automobile industry is laughable. Almost everything that goes into creating an automobile, save labor, is brought in from outside. Baselin is where the Philippines grew rubber, so it makes sense that this is where they made their tires. The companies that initially created tires are no longer around. The oligarchy's narrow left used national pride as a justification for their protectionist measures that prevented the Philippines from entering the industrial age. Philippines suggested skipping the industrialization phase and going straight from agriculture to services as a means of making up the difference. It shifted its focus from selling manufactured items to outsourcing human labor. The business process outsourcing industry may have originated in the service sector, but it is very mobile. Many economists have been sounding the alarm that excessive reliance on overseas workers and business process outsourcing is unsustainable. The Philippines needs a third leg, manufacturing. Economist Bernardo Villegas said, there was no question that a country with as large a population as the Philippines would never be really considered industrialized if manufacturing does not constitute a fair share of the gross domestic product and employs a significant percentage of the labor force. Over the years, manufacturing in the Philippines contributed around 20% on average to GDP, although in most of its neighbors, manufacturing accounted for 30% or more of GDP and employed more than 15% of the workforce. Manufacturing's rising relative importance to the overall economy is a hallmark of each developed country with a sizable home market. The lack of a real integrated steel mill is a major factor in the slow development of the industrial sector in this nation. It had a mostly symbolic integration in the 1960s. After it ran into money problems and failed to get underway, the government seized it. Some Indian investors acquired it once it was privatized. The current situation of the trash heap in Iligan calls for its melting down to make way for more productive uses of the space. A strong steel industry is essential to every nation's efforts to develop its manufacturing sector. Villicus said that iron and steel were the essence of the first industrial revolution that occurred in England 
in the last decades of the 19th century. The irony is that the world is now in the fourth stage of the Industrial Revolution, and the Philippines has not yet developed a strong domestic steel industry. Villegas believed that the restricted market in the Philippines was another factor that contributed to the country's inability to establish a successful steel industry. This is understandable given that a significant section of the population in the Philippines lives below the national poverty line and hence does not have a significant demand for steel goods. But given that consumers drive the economy, things ought to be different now. The most recent population estimate for the Philippines is 107 million people, and the country's middle class is expanding. This should be large enough to form a viable market, which is necessary for the growth of a local steel sector. This is perhaps also why investors are becoming interested in the concept of constructing an integrated steel plant in this location. The largest steel company in China approached Ben Yao of Steel Asia and expressed interest in forming a joint venture to build a real integrated steel factory in Asia. Ben said that they went to Cagayan de Oro's Vividec Industrial Park and signed an MOU to build a $4.5 billion steel factory there. China's Hubei Iron and Steel, the fourth largest steel producer in the world, is under complete Chinese government control. They are now doing a feasibility assessment and hope to make an investment decision this year. Once they start rolling, the project's two stages will take between three and five years to complete. The plant can manufacture up to 8 million tons of basic steel annually. Construction grade and high strength construction steel, aerospace engineering steel, nuclear power steel, shipbuilding and marine engineering steel, and railway steel are just some of the many types of steel that can be produced at this facility. But there's a catch. The feasibility research revealed that there are few to no quality requirements for steel goods in the Philippines, and that those that do exist are only partially enforced. There is also considerable smuggling of low-quality steel items and a sizable gray market. The playing field is not level. In a nation prone to earthquakes, low-quality steel poses a real threat to human life. DTI is supposed to create enforced norms, but it has been struggling to do so. Anyway, if this investor does come in, President Duterte will be able to claim victory, and DTI Secretary Ramon Lopez will have a major accomplishment to boast about. Simply put, Secretary Lopez has to ensure that a large investment in a somewhat fundamental part of our economy isn't scared away by our lax governance, as more and more industries say goodbye to Philippine industries. It is important to examine the circumstances that contributed to the industry's untimely decline in the competitive business environment. Having said that, it should be admitted that even the most prosperous businesses are susceptible to experiencing failure at some point. In addition, the industries may have been confronted with severe rivalry from its competitors. It is essential to differentiate oneself and create distinctive value propositions in a market that is becoming more competitive. However, Philippine Industries was unable to properly separate itself from its competitors, which resulted in a fall in market share as well as a reduction in profitability. Last but not least, external factors like economic downturns and global crises also contributed to the industry's lagging performance. Events that are out of their control frequently have an impact on businesses in all sectors, and this is also true for the Philippine industrial sector. The industries that have quit the Philippines should not forget the things they have learned from this experience. Let's hope that the challenges they have faced will serve as a reminder of the significance of adaptation, visionary leadership, distinctiveness, and resilience in the constantly shifting environment of the corporate world. That's all for today, guys. If you like this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and press the bell icon for any new updates. See you in the next one.